So here's the deal. Kotaku basically want to be bullied on for clout. And this time, they successfully put some bait out into the Twitter sphere that resulted in Microsoft taking that bait. And the Game Pass Twitter account utterly ratioing them into, into oblivion, right? Seems like a very common dunk. We then have a whole discourse spew forth of people saying that it's uh, unprofessional of Microsoft to do this and people accusing Kotaku of half a million different things. When you actually look at the story, there's a hell of a lot more to it. We're in a direct consumer era where the press are becoming either less relevant or just really going to have a different role in things going forward. And then for Kotaku, uh, you know they're paid by uh, advertisements and clicks, right? Why do you think that this headline would happen, especially when the actual article is pretty fucking neutral? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did did everyone just get baited by a savvy EIC or a savvy Kotaku Twitter person that thought, ah, hang on, I want our website to be the main character of Twitter today? That is, I think, in essence, exactly what happened. I think the writer Ari Notice saw... Here's three tweets of three different verified Twitter users saying they're unsubscribing from Game Pass. Verified must be true. Yep. That sounds like we've got ourselves a whole thing. And thus went and written an article that was, you know, basically very decidedly neutral. It was, here's, you know, people have said they're unsubscribing. Here's why that could be. It's because Microsoft haven't released big games. But there's also loads of indie games and stuff like that. So it's kind of whatever. Sure, great. And then the headline is, Xbox Game Pass Burnout. And then everyone's like suddenly jumping on the pile, just trying to kick the shit out of Kotaku for being, you know, bitty and like saying, no, Game Pass is actually great. You're not thinking of all these indie games exactly like Xbox did. So I don't know if it's like it's super intentional or kind of like accidental, but they very much embarrassed the shit out of themselves, but probably came out better for it. Yeah, at this point, I'm almost sure that it's a weird kink that Kotaku has. (laughs) uh, That's just a part of their business model. They Mm -hmm. are so good at becoming the main character of Twitter yeah. by just doing tweets with super baity, super baity text. And this just seems like that again. It's quite funny too, because the whole tell me you li- you know, you limit yourself only to AAA without telling me that you do that. And you think of like Kotaku and what people will um, assume of them, which is just, oh, they don't play real games. They just play artsy fartsy indies, huh. hmm. which, was was quite funny. (laughs) Um, So it's a funny little situation. Ultimately, it is a minor win for Kotaku in that they get a whole bunch of traffic and name recognition. I think that's one of the things. Kotaku is probably decently good at projecting itself out there. Yeah, I have a feeling Kotaku is actually less relevant than most people think. (laughs) all, All it literally takes is one look at the stuff they're putting on their homepage. And you know they are really probably quite struggling financially and struggling to get page views. Which is why stuff like this and like that name brand recognition is super important to them. Yeah. Uh, And then, of course, it's a very obvious win for Microsoft. We're able to come in there, basically perform a little bit of jujitsu, topple them over with the weight of their own headline Mm -hmm. and 60K likes. And that's just as of the time of this screenshot. Uh, It's a great way for them to directly rally their own base. That's one of the important things here, right? Rallying the base because... Now all of this stuff doesn't really happen in the consumer advice sphere. That's not what any of these sites are now. No. You know, you don't want the... People might think they want the, you know, witch.com, witch.co.uk. You pay a subscription, you get unbiased reviews. People might think that they want that. And I think they might actually say that they want that. But when it comes down to the attention economy, Mm. it's culture war shit that actually gets people engaged. This is another expression of that that is ultimately useful for Kotaku and useful for Microsoft. Yep, and to as far as I'm concerned, actually kind of useful for consumers in one way, which is that it has a lot of people actually talking. It's the kind of thing where otherwise no one will be talking about Game Pass. Everyone just be like, eh, yeah, whatever. But now it's like, okay, actually, Kotaku have raised maybe an interesting point about this. Is is Game Pass only for indies? Is that what's kind of happening at the minute? And then people ended up having pretty good discussions online about it. And then even uh, Game Industry Top Ace kind of hopped in later on. We'll talk about that in a bit. But they went and spoke to people. Went okay, well, okay. Here's a, here's we're going to do some actually game industry stuff. Here's a company called Game Discover Co. And here's everything they figured out about what it actually you know how indies perform on Game Pass. And I don't know if it was directly related or if it was just kind of do you know the way the kind of 
the, the winds coalesce on like topics sometime. Yeah. And you get like almost in the same way you get like two movies that are almost exactly the same. You get articles that are all about the same subject in the course of like two days. You're like, that's kind of an interesting coincidence. But it's definitely just time to talk about Game Pass two weeks before Microsoft's a big event. Yeah. So essentially for Kotaku's point, hmm. here's a few of the tweets. I'm unsubscribing. I got to admit, I barely use it. I'll be back, but for now, there's no point. Wow. <laughs> what a shocking revelation. Take him saying, Gene's right. Feels like a chump prepaying all these years. Just talking about... Basically, it comes down to no AAA big games. And yeah. the funny thing is, it's not really that many tweets. It's just a bunch of verified accounts that people are echoing. <laughs> Literally three. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it does make you wonder, like, is this just something that just kind of manifests out of Twitter so that there can be an article about something? Yeah. <laughs> um, but there is an actual point to make. Of course, yeah. Where are the first parties? And we will get to that. In terms of the points Kotaku actually makes, it's really quite simple. It's basically just, hey, Bethesda, their games have been delayed. And then pointing out, like, they've done well off big AAAs, including the likes of Guardians of the Galaxy, and then a bit of just praising the service for its lineup. Yeah. That's a, like the article is really not particularly. Uh, there's nothing really extremely notable. It, it's just that. Yeah, they l almost literally turns out just yeah. Game Pass isn't always super pumped full of really interesting games, and then you go well, okay, yeah. Then there's you know obviously yourself. You go oh, Citizen Sleeper, Track to me this bump. It's pretty interesting enough. It's not super great, but it does the job, and th th that's it. Three tweets and some kind of wishy washy. Ah, it's sorry. And there you go, <laughs> article. Yeah, now for the clapback. Obviously, yeah. we've got the big statement from uh, from Microsoft. Then In Exile, who of course were acquired by Xbox, they're doing the likes of um, Torment, Tides of Numenera, and Wasteland. Uh, they hopped in, right? So just somebody saying, must be rough knowing you'll be making Game Pass fodder for the foreseeable future. Now, the thing there is, that's just bullshit, bullshit yeah. brainlit uh, console wars rhetoric, right? So we don't give a shit about that here. Mm -hmm. uh, in Exile, though, apparently do. So they said, full creator freedom, financial support, millions of gamers playing and loving our games. It's a dream highly recommended. It's, yeah, it's... it's yeah, a, like it's, if... And it's something Mike Rose uh, talks about later. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like if you're an indie and you get in Game Pass, it's like, okay, great. Your production budget is now covered. Maybe even some more. Yeah. People will know about your game. People will actually play your game. And people playing your game and you getting feedback is, like, invaluable. It's yeah. massively helpful. The same probably goes for Sony's whenever that gets spun up, too. Yeah, everyone thinks about the, you know, the big, the in the big terms, the big, oh, the big publisher, massive hits. Oh, the user is super hyper value. You're like, yeah, well, it's good for developers, especially in this form. So, like, yeah, if you remember developers, like, yeah, Game Pass kind of owns. And, of course, Wired Productions coming in. They're an indie pub saying exactly what you would expect. And, I mean, what they're saying is true. Again, it's all just Kotaku have put a massive amount of bait out, basically just inviting everyone to clown on them. And I don't really know what they're playing at. Because... Probably nothing. Kotaku's name means less than it ever has. Yeah. Right? Like, even when there were people at Kotaku, like, doing really, uh, you know, like, big investigative reports, Kotaku were still continually clowned on. Mm -hmm. Like, some of the culture content and, and stuff like that that they did. Now it's like they've lost those big reports. They're just kind of this, you know, content, just general shit factory. Yeah. And th they continually just have everyone clown at them. And it's weird because you, I mean, take a look at, say, Polygon. You know, and like Polygon, if you were to kind of put this on a sort of political and societal commentary axis, you'd imagine that uh, Polygon and Kotaku would be like similar enough. So it's like... Why do Polygon not get clowned on all the time in the way that Kotaku is? It's like, it's kind of telling us like they're similar in terms of positioning in the market. Like there are kind of similar publications, but Kotaku is the one that reliably has the worst name and gets clowned on the most. Yeah, I think that is literally because they, they are, they actually play the class clown. They do the dumb stuff and they kind of, they seem to get a kick and clicks out of people watching them be stupid and just kind of do that over and over again. Because that's probably the most engagement they've had in ages. And if someone clicks to that engagement and goes, oh yeah, I might click a couple other things because, you know, either they're baited further or they're kind of enjoying it because it's not, I mean, it's milk toast stuff. It's just kind of nothing. But, I mean, sure. It's, it gets people there. Yeah. Job. Most importantly, silence brand. Yep. 
keep this in mind. For both sides of this, yeah. Yeah, almost everything's a fucking marketing strategy. Everything's trying to get your engagement for a goddamn reason. And, uh, you know, if you allow yourself to feel like you're in any side of this, then you're being played. For sure, yeah. Right, you're being played. Your attention is being directed somewhere by a big company. The thing is that because of the mechanics of social media, they're making you think it was your idea to jump in. Well, no, that was their intended result the entire time. Yeah, that's so. Ex- yeah, the, the, <laughs> like if you think about why the Xbox the account replied, obviously it might have been the social media manager going, that'll be kind of funny and also kind of true and also it'd work. But it had legions of these people be like, oh, oh yeah, Xbox is good at PR. They're really cool. And they've attacked our enemy, our shared enemy, Kotaku, for being wrong about all of the cool indie games they have. Sweet. Absolutely perfect. Yeah. Oh, Masterstroke yeah. from yep. that person on the Xbox team. Yep. Brilliant piece of marketing. For sure, yep. So, you know, they, they've done a, an incredible job. Um, I think we're just sort of here in the sidelines saying, ah, careful now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah w- watch, the, watch the fight, watch the brawl, but don't get involved in it. Don't get invested in it too much. Don't don't bet, right? Watch it, but don't bet. I think yeah, that's the, that, that's that's the correct That's pretty much move. it. Uh, now, is there actually any evidence with Game Pass, though? What's going on? Well, we've got the former Xbox VP who said... Uh, Ed Fryce, who said, Game Pass scares me because there's a somewhat analogous thing called Spotify that was created in the music business. Uh, Here, I mean, it literally cut the annual revenue of the music business in half and it's made it so people just don't buy songs anymore. Now, you do then worry there could be a state where everything is on PS++++, whatever the hell it's called now, uh, or Game Pass. And if you're in the middle then the relative cost of your experience is so much higher. Mm -hmm. And that then means that success in the games industry turns into something that is, I I suppose, over-indexing one's ability to, say, get a publisher who has contacts at a big company or to make those contacts yourself, right? It pushes more of that towards business skills, which not all of the best games creators will have. Because yeah. they've been busy honing their craft. Yeah, especially that when... That can be like, worrying. Yeah, and you kind of argue, well, okay, well, then you go and, you know, Steam discoverability is really good. Stuff that crops up on Steam out of nowhere. But you kind of have to get the money to get to that point to release it fine. Where a lot of, like, the joy of Game Plus and PS Plus will be getting people over the finish line in a risk-free way. So, like, games are easier to make. So they inadvertently have a little bit too much of the power. So as Ed Freak was on to say, you know, we have to be careful we don't create the same system in the game business these markets are more fragile than people realize. He goes on to talk about um, how he watched a couple of different industries crash, including games in like the 80s and stuff, because they kind of fell for these like, oh, this market will survive this, but they didn't. So it kind of maybe, maybe has a point, but are a little bit too early to tell. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's a cautionary tale, and yeah. certainly on Spotify, there are lots of artists who don't really feel like yeah. they are being properly valued by yeah. that platform's payment. That okay. said... We do have uh, Tim, who's the editor of uh, Music Business Worldwide, who told VGC that Spotify didn't actually do that. It was piracy yep. mm-hmm. that did that to the music industry. Think anyone can attest to that if they're around at the time, yeah? Well, LimeWire? What? <laughs> uh, so there's that. Uh, so when Spotify launched in 2011, the global music industry pulled in $15 billion. Uh, 2021, that's $25.9 billion. Split in half, indeed. <laughs> yeah, now at Spotify has problems yeah we you know that's fine it's talked about quite a lot um here's something from TechCrunch though Mm -hmm. 51 percent of concert goers buy tickets to shows of artists they discovered through streaming according to a new study by eventbrite and certainly the likes Mm -hmm. of the spotify discovery queue before it got completely infested by soundtracks that are not (laughs) what i want to listen to uh did surface loads of just shit i had not heard yes so i can buy that yeah, no, I have, um, I've been to a show and I've had merch or stuff that's been, like, specifically brought to me by Spotify. So, like, yeah, I, I can anecdotally say I can see how that works and having that, uh, like, stat to back it up is kind of like the bo- bonus monetization part, I think, where, you know, the music itself is, like, the product you enjoy, but then you show, like, fandom or appreciation through other means. And that kind of is, like, bonus monetization. I think games, a lot of what people talk about is games can do the same. Yeah. On the likes of, uh, like, I mean, it comes from, like, free-to-play games as well, where it's like, yeah, okay, yeah, you didn't pay anything for the game, or you didn't pay much for the game, but by playing it, by continuing to buy DLC, by continuing to, you know, do microtransactions and stuff like that, for the big games, at least that makes sense, the same markets there. And I think the whole point is just that music and games are different. 
So you can kind of look and go, maybe this will happen. But you do have to kind of go, well, uh, maybe it won't. Yeah. Maybe it won't. Uh, now, we do have another fun little thing from Game Discover Co., right? Yeah. So they made a hype score that is based on the publicly available information for 8,000 plus pre-released indie games. And it basically tracked how well their hype uh, score that they created translates to Steam reviews and peak concurrent users. Uh, and it's quite interesting. So the average conversion against their track games above a certain score was approximately 0 0.14. Uh, for the 45 or so day one Game Pass games that they tracked, well, the average conversion was higher at 0 0.17. Mm. Yep. So that is suggesting that the indies that get the Game Pass generally do a bit better. Yeah, about 20% better. Yep. Now, there's going to be a few reasons for that. First, mm. to get onto Game Pass, you have to pass through multiple gates of yeah. quality. Right? So there's like a, I think a selection bias there, like Microsoft are not going to accept stuff that's not good. Mm -hmm. But I think still that point, uh, I think does stand to a degree. And if we just hop into what Mike Rose has said, uh, Game Pass is guaranteeing success for dozens of devs every single month by paying them the entire dev costs and then some on day one. Anyone tweeting it's bad for devs has zero clue. A lot of that's true. I mean, here's a really good uh, example for Pale Beyond, right? Once that game is finished, it will be a while before we see any money from it because, of course, the game has to go out. It has to get sales. Then there's any costs incurred with marketing. There's any of the costs. Uh, well, there's the production costs, which, you know, of course, between us and the publisher and then also an ice screen, everyone's got to get paid, which, of course, makes sense because everybody did contribute to the game. And uh, you know, a lot of people, they just like to pretend publishers are like pure evil or something. Yeah. Our game literally wouldn't exist if a publisher didn't look at it and say, oh, okay, you two 20-somethings in the company. Oh, yeah, sure, whatever. Here's the money. <laughs> yep. Didn't exactly go like that. There's a little bit more. But, you know, the, the publishers definitely do deserve... Uh, plenty for making it actually uh, possible and in a case like this well for our publisher it would be pretty awesome because they'd be like okay sweet we're, you know, we're going to hit roi for us it's actually the same thing we're like oh sweet we're going to hit roi but then also by guaranteeing that money it would allow for me and thomas to more properly plan the next six to 12 months because what it does is it massively reduces um uncertainty and that means that you can actually get started on your next project or just whatever you want to do next way more readily when Game Passes came in or any of these things if they come in and then give you that financial security. So that's a lot of why for publishers and developers in the indie scene, um, you know, it, it's just awesome. Yeah. It's just awesome. Like I, I know one or two uh, who have been on Game Pass and that was all like universally positive reviews from them. So... Yeah. Yeah. You don't even have to be... <laughs> it's a good thing for the companies. Yeah, you don't even have to be too indie for this to happen either because there were two recent examples of like people not getting the royalties back. And that was uh, Outriders. Didn't make any money. Didn't get any royalties in Square Enix for Outriders because Game Pass paid all the money and they haven't actually made any more than that. So Outriders clearly hasn't made any money, but Game Pass kind of sorted them all out and Square Enix sorted them out on that front. So they're not too pissed off about it all. And then same with Alan Wake Remastered. Apparently it hasn't uh, outsold what Epic gave them in terms of the minimum guarantee. So they haven't made any money from Alan Wake Remastered sales because Epic already gave them all the money they would make and seemingly more. So it's like, it is just makes sense for devs to be like, yeah, you're going to pay us? Sure, yeah, right, go for it. Yeah, so basically that's the situation. For individual developers and publishers, Game Pass is pretty awesome. For consumers, it offers a pretty great value. And what we do see, though, is that there is a section of people who really do want to play the big AAA games. For them, the value is this game would cost me 60 or $70. Mm -hmm. And usually I would buy maybe 10 of these in a year. Oh, yeah. wow, look at Game Pass. What an incredible deal. Mm -hmm. Those people are definitely seeing Microsoft's you know, issues with delays and stuff come in and uh, decrease the value proposition. For sure. So that's mm -hmm. totally... Basically, this whole thing is like totally reasonable and fair. <laughs> And <laughs> yeah. really, this is just about examining how social media works and not being caught up in emotion. Yeah. Right? Because all of, you know, all of this shit, like from, like I'd say, Xbox were right to do this. This oh, was shit, a yeah. fantastic strategic move. I know there's people complaining, oh, it's unprofessional. And oh, look at the console fans. Kotaku basically invited that on themselves. Yeah. In a situation like that, how do you expect them to act? They see an opportunity. What do you do? You seize the opportunity. How much would this amount of reach actually cost 
by traditional <laughs> advertising. So this completely does make sense. Uh, it's a lesson for Kotaku and how they want to position themselves publicly. Do they really want to start throwing all of this bait out? Perhaps they actually do, and they just like getting the clicks that comes from that, regardless of what it means for their brand. But also, if you think about Kotaku, it's been a revolving door. It's mm. had all those issues with the union, with the company that owns it. Could it be a situation where basically people at Kotaku don't really give a shit about the company name? They're just kind of doing their job and trying to make the numbers go up, and they're checked out. I wouldn't be surprised based on what some ex Kotaku people sort of say. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So there you go. That's the situation. Not too much else to say. Um, yeah. Let me know what you think. Is Game Pass something that you have uh, perhaps dropped off? Mm -hmm. uh, let us know, and we'll catch you next time. <laughs>